Well, so good to see each one of you here today. I'm Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Mannheim Grace, and would love to meet you if you're a guest here with us today. Would love to uh, be able to shake your hand and meet you and get to know you a little bit. So come introduce yourself if you're a guest. Well, uh, we have had a fun weekend in our house. Our, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and their daughter, Emma, who is, I'm going to get wrong, how many months old? 21 months old, I think, 22 months old. And it's been a little bit nostalgic for me. And the reason why it's been nostalgic, let me go ahead and kick the house lights back up, people can see. The reason why it's been nostalgic for me is because I've got an eight-year-old daughter, Abby, and I've been walking around the house this weekend seeing these. I mean, come on, how cute are these shoes, really? And so it's kind of taken me back a little bit and uh, one of the things that I used to always love, I still do with my kids, but now that they're older, it's like trying to tackle them to get them to do this. Read to them, okay? When they were littler, I always loved to read. And there was a particular um, poet and philosopher that I loved to read to them by the name of Dr. Seuss. That was supposed to be a joke. Nobody laughed. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? And hey, you guys know Dr. Seuss, right? Come on. Green eggs and ham, Sam, I? Yeah. Oh, come on. It's easy, okay? Well, there was a particular Dr. Seuss song call, book called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. We, I used to give it to graduates that would graduate, kind of as a fun graduation gift. Well, this Dr. Seuss book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, listen to these words as we jump into our message today. It's the great Dr. Seuss says, you'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to great heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang. You'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. And wherever you go, you will top the rest. Except when you don't, he writes. Because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You get all hung up in a prickly perch, the gang will fly on and leave you in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump. And the chances are then you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Because unslumping yourself is not easily done. How true. The words of Dr. Seuss. I'm going to preach on Dr. Seuss instead of Psalm 46. I'm just kidding. But such is the condition of our human experience, isn't it? This idea that was so greatly described by the great deep thinker and philosopher, Dr. Seuss, as he describes the ups and downs of life, the highs and the lows. The times when God feels close to us. He feels near. And the times when it's, we're asked, we find ourselves asking the question, Lord, where are you? Have you ever been there? Well, we are, again, uh, going to be talking about a Psalm 46, and we've been in a series called Summer Playlist. We've been using the idea of like an old school playlist that you might have of summer songs. And those songs stay in your head and you sing them and they pop back in your head. And maybe you go to sleep and you wake up and you hear them again. We've been introducing our kids this summer to some of our old school songs that we used to sing or we used to listen to as kids. And our kids have loved them. And they're scripture, so it's great. And I think 
on some of our travels, uh, our travels to the Outer Banks a few weeks ago, I believe the over-under on how many times you listen to one, one uh, song in particular was about 40, so... I think we forgot that CD on our next trip. <laughs> but the same is true with the songs of Psalms, the book of Psalms, right? We're calling this our summer playlist because we want the songs of Psalms and the truths that we find there to be our playlist in our hearts and our minds when we experience life. We want the experience that the psalms, that the authors in the psalms go through, and there are many authors, David, the main one, we want the experience that they went through, the battles that they fought, the highs and lows that they experienced to help us. And that's what they do. And that's one of the reasons why I love the psalms. The authors of the psalms, they're not afraid to show their emotions. I can relate to that. I can relate to times in my life when I can honestly, quite honestly, and almost physically shake my head at God and say, God, what are you doing? Perhaps you've been there too. Well, the Psalms, the author of the Psalms do that. And most, you know, undoubtedly by the end of the Psalm, they're not physically, but almost in, in matter of heart, on their knees before the Lord, thanking him for who he's done and what, for who he is and what he's done. But the Psalms give us a language to teach us how to walk with God through those challenging seasons and realities of life. I'll never forget uh, this moment very early on in my marriage to Jennifer and my only marriage. That was a little weird. <laughs> uh, and we were in our first apartment. It was only a few, I, I, I might get the time right, but it was only a few months after we were married. We were in our first apartment, and it was in the evening. We were both, she was a teacher, and I was uh, teaching at a school as well. So we were on that school schedule. We were in the evening, kind of wrapping up from dinner, and she received a phone call. So we sat on the couch together. And tears started welling up in her eyes. And she got off the phone, and she said, that was my mom. She has cancer, lymphoma. And I can remember Jennifer in that moment tearing up and kind of slumping into my arms and me cradling her and not knowing what to say feeling like the words just weren't there. We cried together. We cried out to God. We said, Lord, where are you? Why, do you? why do you in this moment feel so silent? I wonder if you've ever experienced anything similar. Perhaps it just wasn't, perhaps it's not just one event. Maybe it is just one event in your life that you've experienced. That's the reality of our existence, our humanity. We do experience those times. Maybe it's a whole season of life that's like, God, where are you in this season? Why are you silent when I need you the most? You know, it was Job. When we think about challenges in life, we think about Job, right? What he went through. It was Job that said, man is born to trouble like sparks that fly upward. It's going to happen, is what he's saying. Well, I've got good news for you, each of you today. And like I said earlier, and I do believe this, that God brought you here in this place on purpose today to hear a message, not from me, but from God. Psalm 46 will help us know what to do and where to turn when unslumping ourselves seems impossible when God feels distant, when he feels silent. And so I need to ask you, when trouble impacts your life, how do you unslump yourself? Kind of a weird way to say it, whatever. I'm going with Dr. Seuss. How do you unslump yourself? Is unslumping yourself even possible? Well, God has a plan. 
He wants to come alongside us during these seasons and help us. His plan is pretty simple. Simple doesn't always mean easy. Simple but quite profound. It's in the midst of trouble to be still and know that he is God. When trouble comes, be still. So let's unwrap Psalm 46 together today. You can turn there in the Bible in front of you or jump on your phone or your device, whatever you have. Psalm 46 is where we're going to be planted this morning. And before we jump in any further, why don't I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to pray for us. Lord, thank you for the truth in your word. I pray that we would have a tenderness and a softness of heart before you this, excuse me, this morning, that we would hear a message for each one here, that there would be a message for each one here in Psalm 46. I know that there is, Lord. Help us to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Psalm 46 begins um, with a lead verse, which is often the case in many psalms. Many of the psalms lead with a single verse or a, a couple verses that operate kind of as a theme for that particular psalm. And that's the case in Psalm 46. That's exactly what happens in verse 1 where we begin, the author says, God is our refuge and what? Strength. God is our refuge and what? It? Strength. Doesn't sound very strong the way you said that, but that's okay. An ever-present help in trouble. This idea of refuge and strength we find in many other places in the Psalms. And it's the idea of refuge as a place to run to for safety. Our strong place to run to. God is our refuge and strength. The place when we're having trouble, we can run to and find comfort, find protection. An ever-present help in trouble, a very present help in trouble. God is described as this ever-present help in trouble. In the original language, it literally can mean that he can be found when you need it. An ever-present help in trouble means that when you need him, he's going to be found. He's always there. Always ready to help in times of trouble, the New Living Translation said. Always ready to help in times of trouble. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. I think about our son Jacob, who's three, when I read this, and he can be in, intimidated, as many three-year-olds can, depending on the environment that we're in. And his latest thing is, besides just you know yelling for mommy, which he often does, he will, uh, when we're in a, a, out in public in a, in a place that's kind of scary, just reach his hand up to us, want, want us to hold his hand. And he does that regularly. And... He calms down immediately when we, when we grab his hand. And I picture this idea of God being our refuge and strength being in a, a similar way, what's being said here in Psalm 46. That God is always there, an ever-present help in trouble. He's our place of safety. Like my wife and I, our hands, are, are per, we are a place of safety for Jacob. He feels safe with us. That's how it is with God. He's our refuge and our strength. He's our place of safety. But unfortunately, most of the time, at least I can speak from my own experience, most of the time I don't run to God when I'm facing a trial or a challenge. Instead, I run to a different place. I run to trying to figure it out myself. Or I run to working harder. Or I run, to, I run to fill my time with anything so I don't have to think about that one thing. Sadly, oftentimes my, what feels like my last response is run to Jesus. 
He's my place of safety. He's my refuge and my strength. See, we, re we receive an invitation as this psalm begins to go to him for strength. The opening verse affirms a radical trust in the protective strength of God. No matter what we're experiencing. That's our first point this morning. Go to him for strength. When you're feeling like you're in a slump, when you're experiencing a challenge, season, challenging season of life, you need to go to him for strength. And remember, he's ever-present help in times of trouble. He's always there. He's always there with open arms, ready to be there for us. The reason we go to him for strength is because we can trust him. We go to him because we can trust him. We can trust in his power. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, the language here of the psalmist is depicting the entire world turning upside down. You see it there, right? Though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, what would happen if that happened? We'd be like, it's the end of the world, right? Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, even when that, even if that were to happen, what does the psalmist say? We're not gonna fear. Why do we not have fear in those moments? Because God is our what? Refuge and strength. An ever-present help in times of trouble. Maybe you'll remember that, the idea of Jacob holding his hand, okay? Sometimes, um, when I'm not being aware of what's happening around me, he'll, Jacob will, or I'm talking to somebody, Jacob will have his hand up next to me. I won't be seeing, I don't see what he's doing. So I'll, I'll keep walking or turn around, and he like will circle around me until I see him. You know, it's like, it's not that way with God. When we reach out to God, he's there. He's our ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. No matter what we hear from the doctor, no matter how helpless or broken our relationships are, no matter how bleak the future feels, we will not fear no matter what happens. Though the earth gives way, the mountains tremble, we will not fear. Have you ever experienced Perhaps a situation in your life where it felt like everything you knew previously was upended, turned upside down. All stability and consistency to which you once knew now felt completely upended, gone. And you felt like the earth had literally shifted beneath your feet. That's what the psalmist is pointing to. It's those moments that we do not fear because God is our refuge and strength. There's a river. <clears throat> whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. This river is oftentimes in Scripture, when you see river, it's oftentimes talking about kind of hearkening back to Genesis in the Garden of Eden. When life was perfect, when there was no sin, when God walked among Adam and Eve and the people, and that life was as it should be as God created it to be. But of course, it's not like that now because of sin. So he's hearkening back to those days. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. Listen to this. This is beautiful language. He lifts his voice. The earth, what? Melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Do we live in a day today where nations are in an uproar? Where kingdoms fall? Is that accurate today? when you flip on the news or hear what's going on around our world? 
the author says, even in the midst of this unrest, even when nations are in chaos and kingdoms are falling, God lifts his voice and the earth melts. Now what's that telling us? That there's power in God, in his voice. Not only is he with us, not only can we trust in his power, but the God of Jacob is our fortress. Second idea today, that we need to remember the past. This is how we unslump ourselves. We go to God for strength. Secondly, we remember the past. One of the things that builds my faith is that I sometimes look back at past encounters with God in the ways that he's always come through for me. And in those moments, no matter what I'm experiencing in the present, I begin to trust in him more no matter what I'm currently experiencing because I remember what he did for me in the past. Looking back at what God has done, behold the works of what God has done. Let's continue on in Psalm 46. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Looking back at what God has done in the past and trusting that God who is all-powerful, the God who loves you, the God whose love can never be separated from you, will keep his promises. And you can believe that and you can take that with you in the future. In Joshua 4 I want to turn there. If you have your Bible, turn to Joshua 4. Joshua chapter 4. It's an example of this in Scripture. What was happening was the people, the people of Israel were led by Joshua, and they were going into the Promised Land, and they were fighting battles, and God was giving them the victory. Well, they came up against the Jordan River, and they said, what do we do? It's the Jordan River. We can't cross it. Anyway, so the Lord told Joshua to had the men take the Ark of the Covenant out in front of them, what happened to the water? The water parted, and they walked across on dry land. Uh, starting in verse 4, Joshua 4, 4. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the Ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Did you catch that? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. He said, build a memorial with the stones so you remember. You want to unslump yourselves. You want to experience the goodness of God. Remember what God has done for you in the past. Take time to reflect on how God came through for you. That's what he's saying. Come and see what the Lord has done. I want your kids and their kids and their kids to walk by and see this memorial so they can remember how God came through for us here in this moment, and that they can trust the Lord for whatever comes their way. Those who never experienced this moment, we'll see these stones and recognize what God has done in the past and how he can help us to trust him in the present. Looking back to trust forward. That's why I think personally in the, in the health and life of our church, this concept and idea of testimony is so hugely important because we need to hear from each other. We need to hear about how the Lord is working in our hearts and our lives. So we go to him for strength. We remember the past. And the last point, be still and know. Be still and know. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all that. Let's read that verse together, can we? All together. 
He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I grew up in church, and I heard that verse a lot, and I kind of thought that meant stop wiggling, be still, don't wiggle. I wasn't really much of a wiggler, not like one of my boys. I won't say which one. But that's not what the original language meant. The original language had a much deeper and much more profound meaning. It actually meant to cease striving. Do you hear that? To be still meant to, to stop, to cease striving. That's not our normal response when we face trouble, is it? To cease striving. Uh, this word in Hebrew, actually, there's oftentimes in Hebrew, there's, there's a metaphorical um, understanding of words. And this one in particular has meaning that means to cease striving. And also it means to put your hands down by your side. Can you picture that? Put your hands down by your side. We often try to fight when we're faced with trouble. Instead, God is asking us to put our hands down by our side and surrender, to cease striving. It kind of feels counterintuitive, right? Be still. Cease striving. Put your hands down by your side. Be still and know that I am God. I'm thankful that it doesn't say, be still when it feels right. Know that I'm God when, it, when, I, when things are going well. Instead, it says, be still and know that I am God. It's about what we know about God, reminding ourselves about the truth that we know from God, that he's always with us, that he came through for us in the past. He's going to be with us in the future. He's going to be with us in the present. In the stillness of silence, know that I am God. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Turn over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 as we conclude this morning. Verse 35 of Mark chapter 4. Jesus well, I'll just read it. You'll get the context. That day when evening came, verse 35 of Mark chapter 4, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Talking about across the Sea of Galilee. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up. I love that word. It's a funny word, squall. And the waves broke over the boat. It said it was nearly swamped. Can you picture Jesus was in the stern. What was Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, on a pillow. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? Jesus didn't rebuke them or say, Come on. <laughs> Come on, guys. Instead, he got up and said to the waves, Quiet, what? Be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Peace, be still. If Jesus has the power to command the wind and the waves to be still, he certainly has the power to be near to us during our season of trial. He reminds us, be still and know that I am God. Our hearts and minds, our lives, sometimes feel out of control like the wind and the waves, but Jesus, by the power of his word, can say, peace, be still in your life. We need to remember, be still, to be still and know that he is God. For some of us, it's been a long time 
since we were still before God. Now, I'm certainly talking about physically, because that's important. We need to stop our activity and be still before God. But I'm more important and more thinking about a stillness of heart, right? A stillness of spirit. And I have a challenge for us as a church. I spent a lot of time coming up with this name, okay, so you better all love it. It's a two-minute challenge. See, it's a really good name, right? A two-minute challenge. I want us, and I've been trying my best, and I tell you as your pastor, I fail at this a lot. I've been trying to have two minutes of stillness and silence with the Lord each day without distractions, without the TV on or my phone or without kids running around like crazy. Finding two minutes, that's 120 seconds, of time to be distraction-free still before the Lord. To cease striving, to put our hands down at your side, and be still before God. I want us to do that together as a church. I want us to begin that practice. That's my challenge for us, to have two-minute challenge, two minutes a day of being still before the Lord, of being quiet, away from your phones, of distraction, away from any other things that might be keeping you from having a quietness of heart. So we're going to try that right now, okay? We are going to start our two-minute challenge by taking two minutes right now, and I want you to be quiet before the Lord, be still before him, and do your best not to think about what you're going to eat for lunch, okay? So take two minutes right now, and I'm going to do it with you, okay? And be still before the Lord, and then I'll come up and wrap us up. Well, if you're like me, that felt more like 20, not like two. But I'm telling you, that was two minutes. I don't know if that was hard or easy for you to do, but I want to challenge you to do that, to take two minutes each day in the quietness of your spirit, to cease striving, to put your hand down at your side, and find strength in the Lord. There's so many voices that are trying to speak into our lives in our world today, I want the voice that I'm hearing to be the Lord and not to be everything else around me. And I pray the same for all of you 
Be still and know that I am God. Lord Jesus, thank you for the truth of that psalm. I pray that we would be a, a, a people that would be regularly practicing this concept of being still before you, a quietness of heart and mind, of not thinking about the next thing I got to do, of not thinking about things that are distracting me, things that are not being in your presence. I pray that we would be a people who can be still before you and that it would continue to transform us and, and be a way that you're transforming us and molding us into the men and women you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to be still and remember that you are God. Amen.